Hi, willkommen zum Lukas Filmgespräch zum Film Soul Kids. Äh, heute sind äh, Jan und Nora bei mir im Studio. Äh, schön, dass ihr dabei seid. Äh, ich bin Wilke vom Lukas Team und äh, ich gebe gleich ab an die beiden für das Fragestellen zum Film. Unser Filmfestival Lukas findet ja dieses Jahr wieder hauptsächlich im Kino statt, vom 30. September bis 7. Oktober in Frankfurt, Wiesbaden und Offenbach. Für alle Schulklassen und Gruppen, die nicht da sein können, haben wir auch wieder das Online-Angebot, also klickt euch mal rein. Vielen Dank an dieser Stelle noch an das Medienprojektzentrum Offener Kanal MOG Rhein-Main hier in Offenbach dafür, dass wir das Studio wieder benutzen dürfen. Aber jetzt zu Soul Kids über Videokonferenz. Heute zu Gast ist der Regisseur Hugo Sobelmann. Herzlich willkommen bei Lukas. Hey, uh, nice to see you, Hugo. Uh, thanks, to you, thanks to you for taking your time and being here with us. And thank you so much for the invite. Yeah. Uh, und äh, für euch zu Hause noch äh, schnell die Spoilerwarnung. Äh, guckt unbedingt vorher den Film, bevor ihr das Filmgespräch äh, schaut. Und ja, ähm, yeah, let's go. Yeah, so a warm welcome uh, from my side. So I really like your film and it was, and it is really authentic. Um, so we want to know how did you achieve that and how did you integrate yourself into the sequences uh, and situations without interrupting it? Thank you so much uh, for your kind words. Um, I hope a uh, young generation like yours will like the film. I speak like an old person, but... <laughs> um, how did I... It was, it was easier than you would think when you, when you see the film. I guess um, there's so much into the music when they're working that they don't even know that I'm here. And especially because we, with my um, DOP, with my camera operator, we were very far away, basically. We had long lens and uh, we were shooting from, not to disturb, you know, not to be in the middle because there are like 30 students in the same class every time or 15 or 20. So we needed to be as discreet as we could. And that's, that's on the technical side of it. But on the human side of it, it was very easy to blend in because um, they, first of all, they're used to seeing cameras, to seeing, uh, they, they, they often film themselves with phones. I guess you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, they're very into their music and then easy with themselves because they have this, what they call this safe haven where no one can do harm basically because there is this collective effort, you know, to make things work. And even if three white French people that they've never seen before, <laughs> we were welcome, like I've never been welcomed anywhere. Especially because I think they, they had this curiosity about us being French and speaking French to each other. So it's like, what are you, Smurfs? Like, <laughs> we didn't know what kind of sounds we were making, you know? <laughs> and, and they were curious about it. So this brought this, this kind of trust between us in a way. And, and then we, we spent uh, 10 weeks, you know, in the school, meaning that they were they were not even looking at us at some point you know and and we had a great relationship it was, it was not to say like they they were at war with us but it's just like you're here and and we trust you we trust what you're filming so we're easy with it and we're never looking at the camera or uh, shushing to ourselves and those kind of things and uh And yeah, that's basically, I said a lot, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's great if it works so well between the team and the actors. So the next question is, um, what was the size of your crew? So how many people stand behind the scenes and how many people work to get this film done? Oh, uh, that's two different questions. But <laughs> uh, in Memphis, three of us. Uh, we did two trips, actually. One was uh, four weeks and then we, uh, we did six months later we did six weeks uh the first trip there was three of us me my camera operator and my sound operator and then the second trip because we didn't we didn't uh i didn't write anything before the film happened at, at this school and then in, in editing basically that's where i built the film um the, the second time around there was my editor with me 
So we had this kind of, because the school is only open four hours a day. So the rest of the day, basically we were uh, shooting and, 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 uh, and editing at this, not editing, but treating the scene in the, the editing room just to see if, what kind of scene we had. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a whole construction of the film, but we knew, okay, this scene kind of tells this story. And this scene is about this story and this kind of emotion and this kind and and it was easier to to shoot that way to have an editor with us. Obviously, I had to convince my producer about that because it's not <laughs> very usual, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, did you have any specific intention when filming? Like, did you want to portray a certain message, or did you want to cover a certain issue? And did that ever change during the making of the film? Um, yeah, uh, I did. No, I, I wanted to transcribe in film what I was seeing. The first thing I thought about was this, like, this is so amazing. This is so beautiful in every way, like artistic, human, collectively, like everything I like is in this space and the resilience and those kind of emotions. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to transcribe the best I could what I saw, that was the first thing, and be truthful to the people I, I, I'm, I'm gonna show the film to. Uh, and I knew before even going to Stax, before uh, I, I made this first travel in those kind of states in the, in the US, so Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, those kind of, this kind of area, which is called the Deep South, where American music was created, basically, and especially in the in the African American community. So blues, jazz, soul, funk, and ultimately hip hop. Um, and I knew that I wanted to make a film about the very close link there is between music and uh, social justice, in a way, you know, and how all those musics I just mentioned and others in every country in the world, every community in the world, as their way of treating wounds and 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 real problems uh, with art. So in the African-American community, music is is the first thing they're, they're taught, you know, like three years old, they're going to gospel. And that's why at 14 year old, they're singing like you've never heard before. Because at three years old, they're in the gospel. And, and that's, that's culture. That's what I call culture. So that was my first intention. And when I, I had a ton of... Um, avenue I could go, you know, the city, the small town in Mississippi, uh, the bayous in, 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 uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and then I, I met the Stax Music Academy. I came to the Stax Music Academy and it was uh, a, a condensed version of everything I wanted to talk about with my trip to the States. And so that made me want, just want to stay truthful and not try to tell something specifically, especially because the film was also wrote uh, and and constructed in the editing room and that's where i not shifted my my intentions but just said okay there are no intentions the intentions is the, the intentions of the school the way i want to tell it is my my cinematic way of uh, transcribing what i saw and the poetry that i saw so um why did you choose this specific year of the school or age group or class? Why did I choose this? Uh, actually, in the film, you can see two, class, two classes. One are 12 to 15 and the other is 16, 17 and 18. I, I guess you can, you can name them. I mean, you can recognize them in the film. Um, the reason why I chose those classes is because they're vocalists. So there's first they're singing and they're dealing with lyrics meaning the meaning of the lyrics mm -hmm. and it's very as you as you saw important in the film like uh, what kind of words are we singing what are we talking about so the other classes we you you have six classes total two are vocalists two are production so behind uh, computers and and making great jobs and, and learning great things but it's not very cinematic and it, it doesn't uh, treat the same subject i wanted you know, and the same energy. Uh, 
uh, and the others are uh, instrumentalist, which is great also, but doesn't have this uh, lyrics thing and this uh, emotion, raw emotion with the lyrics and with singing with nothing else, you know, silence and just your voice. As you can see in the film, a lot of songs we, we chose to, to stay in the, in the film, in the, ed, in the final edit, uh, are a cappella song. And there is this kind of vulner, vulnerability to that. And I wanted to, I wanted to keep that. I wanted to stay close to that. And the second question was why those kids specifically? Because there are, I guess, four that you could mention, two duos that stands out a bit. Um, that's one of the things I shifted in the editing room. My intention at first, because it was easier for me to deal it that way, because it was my first film and in a way it was reassuring to have main characters, you know? And uh, as much as I stayed at Stax and the during the 10 weeks we, we spent there, I, I recognized um, at time that the school was about the collective effort. I wanted to make a film way uh, more open than that, than those four characters. I didn't want the film to be those four characters. And so with all the editing we did, we kind of opened the film. The more, the more it advances, the more it opens, I guess. And you have kind of uh, second characters, I mean, second tier characters that have great scenes and are, that they're their scenes, you know? So the film kind of changed in, in a way. Uh, from the shooting to the editing. Because we spent so much time there, we had tons of performance and we had footage about other kids. So uh, those must have been a couple of really tough decisions for you to make while editing and while building the film in the editing room, which is like a really interesting <laughs> take on documentaries in general. Um, yeah. That, that must have been hard at times. Yeah, especially because the first, I mean, we had like, I think 19 different edits. Yeah. So we spent nine months in editing, like nine full months. Wow. Oh, okay. 19 different versions. And uh, the first one was like two hour, uh, maybe 150 minutes long, two yeah. hour and a half. And now it's basically halfway there, it's 115. Mm -hmm. um, and the film is way better that way, way more clear, way more efficient, way more to the point. And we kept what I thought and defend my heart out with the first version, which was the poetry in the film mm -hmm. and keeping basically the scene in the church uh, with the saxophonist was like the biggest fight I had with my producers because for eight months they asked me to cut that scene because it wasn't on point. It wasn't uh, advancing narration, you know? Yeah. And, and, and this is my biggest battle. This is the biggest battle I fought, I think. And I'm glad I did. Is there, is there something that you and your editor maybe take out of this for the future when uh, having had the experience of building something in the editing room and winning these fights or fighting these wars with your producer. <laughs> Since, yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, to me, it's not even just this scene. It was keeping the, the poetry of the film once again and the poetry of the music and the way uh, we don't have to be efficient at all times. We can yeah. let the audience sink in and just think about what was said just before and take time to do that. And that was, it could have been another scene, but I needed that to make that, that point across, you know? And, and I'm glad I did, and my, my editor stuck with me the whole time. And, but to, to answer your, your, your initial question, uh, tons of scenes I could have put, tons of performances uh, I could have put in the film, and it was heartbreaking to cut. But at some point, you know, the, the, the biggest um, production problem we had was paying for the music, which is basically like, three quarters of the budget of the film because it's only enormous hits from the 60s. Mm -hmm. So even if I wanted to, even if the film had been better with 15 minutes more and three other performances that the audience couldn't miss, we didn't have the money to do that. I have a follow-up question on uh, these so sort of main characters. Did they have any 
influence on you on what you were filming or did they have a say in what they wanted to portray? Um, yeah, first of all, what you what you hear from them, uh, voiceover and everything, we did three uh, interviews. We did three different moments. At every time there was either uh, someone of their family or someone from the Stax Music Academy in the room in the room with us. Mm -hmm. um, then I spoke with everyone about what I wanted to keep in the film. In when we were in the editing room, in distance, you know, like, okay, you said that. Are you still okay with saying that? And I did like basically every every sentence you're here in the film uh, with them, and the rest. What is in the classroom belongs to the classroom. So they had no say in it, but it, neither did I. Like it was a classroom. So uh, they knew that I mic'd them up and everything. So they were okay with it, with that, you know? They knew that there were the main characters we, we, because we didn't equip everyone, you know? Those were the four we, but we didn't film like that, you know? We, we filmed the whole classroom. So everyone felt they were in the film, which made it way more a better experience for everyone uh and um the rest the the few scenes you see outside of the the stacks i proposed those scenes based on what i saw from them when they were leaving school basically john and trevor they're uh, going to the bus station from the the school to the park and they're walking through the park and at times there are like six of us and six of them. And at times there are just the two of them. And obviously for cinematic reasons, I asked them like, did you ever like wake up and go to school with your best friend and just sing along? Because that's what they do basically. And they say, well, yeah, we did it every, every time from eight to 11. I say, you, you mind doing that on this part <laughs> which you take every day? Like it was a, a mix between my cinematographic ideas and what they were and what they like to do. I needed them to be um, okay with spending this time doing that. I didn't want them to be like, okay, I work tomorrow. It wasn't like that. Okay. Um, so I also have another question. Um, so um, you already said a few things about that, um, why you chose it or why you liked it. But I want to know uh, if you learned something from this journey and if you take something uh, from this journey in your future life. Tons of things. Tons of things because I knew that I didn't know. Like when I, when I got there, I knew that I was a, a French white dude asking questions about what it is to be black in uh, those states in, in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was very humble at first and I asked, I, I hope I stayed that way, but, uh, we spent like three months before going to Stax, like just asking a bunch of questions to everyone we were meeting, like musicians. And we actually interviewed the, and that's in the first version of the film. I think we interviewed the first, um, uh, minister, uh, not, not minister, but uh, the first deputy, uh, black deputy in the state of Mississippi. Like we did uh, the first mayor in Mississippi, in a small town in Mississippi that got tons of trouble because this is the reddest state you can find. Um, so I knew that I didn't know and I learned a ton of things. Everything you see in the film and you think you've learned about perspective the, the, the perspective of a young african-american today in memphis i learned also and a lot of things that aren't in the film uh i learned also so everything th this journey was was amazing i thought i knew a few things and and i learned tons tons of it and everything i can say right now about how three years old are put in gospel and that's why at 14 they they have this kind of light in them is just because i learned it during this journey and it one of the things is that it the whole experience uh did comfort me in, in knowing that i already knew that but i think this is the biggest way of showing it that art can really save people like not just influence or just uh, inspire or whatever. No, no, we can save people literally. And that, that's what I saw at Stacks. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, it's um, a really a cool tale in, um, in the documentary that uh, I think it's a really, um, we now have a really interesting fact about the film that it was <laughs> Built in the editing, that because uh, if we if we, when we saw the film, it really took us there, and we were experiencing the film time like almost real time. We were just there and like experiencing a whole year with the people, and it was also natural. And um, I would have never guessed that it was built in the editing room. <laughs> That's no. really interesting. It was because I knew that um, I I didn't want this film to be kind of. Uh, in a Netflix narrative kind of yeah. way, beginning of the year, middle of the year, and then everyone's graduating and making a great final concert. Or, I didn't want that. And most of uh, films that I guess I see uh, aren't yeah. like that. And, and, and I'm influenced by that. And I wanted to, I wanted to be between the lines way more than putting a big stacks front of everything. And that's why we're not talking. We were, it was so easy to fall into um, putting like uh, archive footage from Otis Redding concert and, you know, bringing everyone on board and it's sexy in a way, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I wanted to, to be, I, I thought that place was way deeper than that. And that's one of the main, that's, that's my favorite line in the film. Actually, if you want a, a fun fact, <laughs> my favorite line in the film is at some point, you know, when they're meeting that, that Chandra Williams, that uh, poet uh, with the shaved head and everything, mm -hmm. the, when, when she's exchanging at the end of the scene with, those, with the students that uh, exchange with her after hearing what she said, that there's one guy, uh, his name is Kai Shun. He has this big Afro and he says, we're not making, we're not making hits. Like everyone remembers a time where music influenced them or, or uh, change their per perspective of, of something or just their mood or whatever. We're not making hit music, we're making soul music. And that's kind of what I felt and I wanted to stay true to that and, and I wanted to be more subtle. So as I never did a documentary, I didn't know how to be subtle. I just focus on instinct and film what I felt so asking Kelvin, the, the saxophonist, to go into this church that is two blocks away from the school and that when he was a kid, he knew and he went to that church. He never thought about doing that, but it was as much of a, an experience to him that it was to me. And I wanted to keep that feeling in the film. So I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. I was just acting it on instinct. And, and try to focus on what I was feeling, really. And then in the editing room, it's like, okay, we have a film, but we don't know what it looks like. Like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna be narrative in a way, you know, keep, uh, keep intensity at each time, even though we wanna stay on two different moods. Like there is this feel good mood about the film, obviously. And there's also this kind of, whiny jazz saxophone that makes you reflect on things. And I wanted to keep those two, um, yeah, those two moods in the film, but I was very tricky to make together, to blend in. And that's, that was maybe the biggest difficulty in editing a room. Like, don't go straight for the feel good movie. Okay. So uh, that's uh, basically it from us. Um, do you have anything that you would like to uh, address to the Lucas audience, or any questions that you would like to ask to them to think about? Or no, I'm just I'm just glad if, if people loved uh, like the film or whatever, learn things and and uh, and and enjoy the music, the ride. Uh, that's great, and thank you so much. If you, I mean, don't hesitate to talk about it. At some point, I'll hope we will have a release in in Germany, and I don't know if it's in cinemas or in platform. But knowing a little bit about German cinema, I guess we'll have a, a, a theatrical release, and I hope so, anyways. Uh, and um, and yeah, if you if one day you can go to. Uh, you can you you want to go to Memphis? Contact me on social media, and I'll be in touch with them because it's something that needs to be seen. And okay, there All you right. go. Um, thank you so much, Hugo.
So, Bilman, uh, for taking your time to talk to us today and um, yeah, good luck with your future project. Yeah, good All luck right. with that and good Thank luck you. with the Lucas competition, of course, with your film. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll probably see you in person sometime. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great time. Bye. Euch an den Bildschirm, vielen Dank fürs Einschalten. Und für euch gibt es jetzt nicht viel anderes noch zu tun, äh, solange wie das Festival läuft, als euch äh, im Internet schlau machen, was man noch alles Spannendes und Interessantes bei Lukas machen und sehen kann. Äh, das Festival findet vom 30. September bis 7. Oktober in Frankfurt, Wiesbaden und Offenbach statt. Und am 8. und 10. Oktober zeigen wir die Wettbewerbsgewinnerfilme im Kino des DFF in Frankfurt. Ansonsten schaut unbedingt auf unseren Social Media Kanälen vorbei. Da kann man über alles am Ball Bleiben. Und äh, ja, zuletzt ein dickes Dankeschön an äh, Nora und Jan, dass ihr heute dabei wart, moderiert habt und die Fragen gestellt habt. Und an die Kollegen und Kolleginnen hinter der Kamera natürlich auch ein dickes Danke. Und ähm, ja, wir sehen uns beim Festival.